Okay, welcome everybody to another post session. Um, uh, today, we're very happy to have Han Huang from the University of Missouri, who will speak to us on random geometric graphs and on how to find their underlying metric. Uh, Han, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Patrick. Yeah, first, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me for the talk. Uh, so this talk is about random geometric graph and well, how to find a matrix. And so maybe let me begin introducing the random geometric graph. So it's more or less like an adult random graph, uh, where adult random graph GMP, you have a graph with n vertices. And for each pair of vertices, you connect an edge independently uh, with probability p. And as for random geometric graph, there uh, you try to connect the edge still independently, but for all the vertices, there are underlying points in some matrix space. And the way you connect uh, this edge, uh, it is with a probability, but depending on the distance of the underlying points. So to define this properly, uh, you need basically three components. First of all, I need a matrix space, M. And then I need to have a probability measure on M. That's how I sample points in this space. And also a distance probability function. So whenever I input a distance, I will give up, give out a probability. Usually this is a monotone decreasing function because uh, you want to have a less connection when the distance is further away. And the geo random geometric graph constructed in this way, we denote it as GMM mu p. You first sample m points in m according to mu iid points, and you start with empty graph. Then you're connecting the pairs ij with a probability, which is p and the distance of xi and xj. So in this way, you get a graph, but it carry some information about uh, uh, geometry on M. And we call this the random geometric graph. Perhaps the most uh, natural choice on the random geometric graph, and this has been well studied, is when M is a unisphere and the distance we use the Euclidean distance. And here mu is usually the uniform measure on the sphere and the p is simply a step functions. So it is, I think typically it looks like this. It is one until it hits some threshold. So in this way, there are less randomness in terms of the how you connect the, ed the edges. It's all depending on the points you pick. You pick random points on the sphere and you connect it when their distance is less than r. So this is the, I think, the example where it is well studied. And I think the picture there is on, can you distinguish the values of D or can you distinguish whether this is a random geometric graph or it is just an adult random graph. And then there's just some, there's an extensive line of research on this. Uh, this is a picture I copy from a, a survey from Dushinin and the cash shows. But uh, our focus today is not on this. Uh, so let me try to give the example we are trying to consider. So here, what I would try to do is to increase the complexity of the matrix space. So I try, here we try to relax the constraint, say this is actually a sphere of certain dimension, but just asking it to be the general uh, manifold embedded in Rn. So imagine you have a smooth compact manifold, the dimensional manifold lies in Rn, and you equip with the Euclidean distance. And mu, uh, we're thinking of sort of some like behave similar to uniform me measure on M, but we are not requiring it. Why we uh, sort of increase the complexity on the choice of matrix space, we also try to make the probability distance function 
a bit more reach rather than considering a step function. I'm trying to draw a, a, a decreasing function here. I want something that is continuous. So actually I can review some uh, for different distance. Basically, I want to have some different probability. So we enrich the uh, distant probability function as well. And in this setting, so we have the following questions, which I think is natural to ask. So suppose I have this MD mu, so, and my P, if it's given, so we know P, but we don't know MD mu. Can we reconstruct uh, the manifold or M mu when uh, I give you uh, this a typical realization of this random geometric graph given that n is large enough. So you just have a graph and then there are some edges connected to them. Can you actually identify what is the corresponding manifold? Of course, it, the first question is, can we or not? In what sense we approach this, uh, approximate this manifold? So before we move the, this result, uh, there are some works on identifying the distance between latent points in random geometric graph before. I think the most close that's related to us is the work of Araya and De Castro, where they look at a different setting. Uh, it's similar to, uh, to unrecover the distance, but it's in the sense that they are looking at a ball. But the probability this the distance probability function is different. It's unknown. So also say they are solving the a similar question, but the unknown part comes from this uh how you assign the probability. And then there are many other works on this uh on these questions, but I would say most of them sort of uh is in the frame where the underlying matrix space is known maybe up to some one parameter family where this is sphere of certain dimension or cube of certain dimension. So there are some variation of those settings, but usually uh, the matrix space is known. But for, for us, the question we are interested in is to recover the unknown matrix, in this case, the manifold. Any question or we good? Okay, then I will continue. So here we will try to present our work. So we need some assumption. We can prove something with some assumption on M, mu, and P, but uh, I would say this is reasonable. Certainly, I think it can be relaxed. So first, just for the proof to look simpler, we are assuming this is smooth compact manifold together at this assumption that there is no boundary. When you have boundary, there are other things that you need to take care of. So we just think everything smooth and smooth embedded, and we know the dimension, and this is, uh, has no boundary. The second thing is we need a curvature bound. I think this is a nature assumption. So curvature bounds, if we forgot what we learned in Riemannian geometry, really what we want is how the tangent plane you have a point of the manifold, you have a tangent plane. Then um, as you move along the manifold, the tangent plane starts to rotate. And what you want is how fast this tangent plane rotates. And the right notion to capture it is this kappa, where kappa is sort of the uniform bounds on all points on M of some term bounds on the second fundamental point. So probably I don't want to get into detail on what is the second fundamental form here to deviate from the talk. Basically, let's imagine that if I have my manifold M and I have a point P, this is my TPM. And locally, my manifolds looks like, sorry, I'm not drawing perfectly. looks like a, okay. This should not be, uh, it looks like something like this, and it has a tangent plane TPM. This is my N. But if I have a distance, say looking at this point V, 
if this distance t uh, is, sorry, if this distance is t, then this distance is bounded by kappa t squared. I think this is a simple explanation of what this kappa plays. How how much how fast this uh how fast this uh space is rotating, and this is valid for say this distance is uh, the distance of v to rho to p is roughly one over kappa. So this is first assumptions on how fast the space can bend and for the second assumptions uh, it's locally when i intersected m at any point with a ball it's roughly what you expected is the local structure of uh of m maybe let me draw what i mean i want to find some r greater than zero so that in the manifold if I look at a ball for any point with the radius r, then I'm only getting the piece which is locally connected to my point p. What is the wrong picture is something like this. I have a p and I have an r, and I, when I intersect the ball with a uh, m, I get many disconnected pieces, and sort of I don't just get the local structures. So this is uh, some repulsion uh, assumption set. So what I want is first, I have a control on, so I have a bounce on this uh, curvature. Second, I have a control, I have a bound also on some R zero so that whenever I'm intersecting with a ball with radius R zero, the remaining piece is simple, it's a, it's a connected piece. And we'll think in the regime where my Rm is the minimum of these two values. So that whenever my M intersect with any ball of radius Rm, I know it's roughly just like a, a slightly banded disk, d-dimensional disk in the plane. So this is our assumption. We need, no, need to know these two values so that we know that locally it's really a Euclidean space. Then we also have an assumption on mu. Basically here, I have a small ball probability bounce on mu of any ball of radius r. And what I really want is that, well, this should be proportional to the r to the d. This is what you would expect if you have a uniform measure on a d-dimensional compact manifold. Local, uh, the local volume should be proportional to r to the d. Given, uh, given that you have a ball of radius r. So this is our assumption. Actually, we can relax this, but then our results will be uh, less efficient. And finally, uh, assumption on this distance probability functions, what we really want is that whenever taking the difference of pb and pa, the probability with distance b and that with distance a, we can distinguish them, say they are bounded above and below, proportional to the size of B minus A. So we assume there are two such a uh, constant. And I want it for holes for all A and B up to the diameter of M. Ideally, I don't want this, but later I will discuss this is indeed uh, necessary if we want to recover the Euclidean distance. Okay, so now with these assumptions, maybe let me present the statements. So basically is we have such a GMP, uh, sorry, not GMP, this uh, random geometric graph, then uh, there's a deterministic polynomial in N algorithm that take this graph as input and spit out another graph which is a weighted graph and together with a matrix on this uh, index set. So that with high probability, uh, the probabilities on the graph, so you can imagine with a typical realization of the graph, we can recover, we have these three properties. First of all, 
for every p in m, we can find a vertex so that the corresponding underlying point xv minus p has small geodesic distance, roughly of the order n to the negative c over d. Uh, geodetic distance is roughly, uh, at this point, geodetic distance is more or less the same as Euclidean distance. This part is uh, sort of easy and immediate. This is just by a union bound argument. If you're simple in love point, you know the small world probability, you know what's going on to, to bound this. What we have is the following two. Indeed, for any pair V and W, we can approximate the geodesic distance between xv and xw by the path distance on the graph. Remember, I say we have can construct a weighted graph, and then naturally we have a path distance on the graph. We'll just find is the shortest path with the smallest weight from one point to another point. So this can approximate the geodesic distance up to uh, an error of n to the negative c over d. At the same time, we can also approximate the Euclidean distance from the given uh, matrix, we, which is spit out from the, the algorithm, also to the same errors. So this is the result we have. So basically, we can sort of, in some sense, recover the underlying distance between any two points if n is large enough. And Maybe let's talk about one or two million marks. First, uh, how good is the errors n to the negative c over d? Um, so in my speculation, it seems it's difficult to beat uh, the order n to the negative one over d. The reason is that uh, imagine you want to have, uh, you have n points and in, if you want, if you want in each epsilon ball of the manifold, you have a point, xv lies in it. The right assumption on n is that n need to be one over epsilon to the d, in which in terms correspondingly, if you convert a row of n and epsilon, then epsilon is n to the negative one over d. But this is just on how you samples how close the points you have. So if this is my speculation, I don't know if that really just implies that uh, your error cannot be this or not. That seems to me it's a nature assumption. On the other hand, uh, I guess from a practical point of view, we really want to know, okay, for what end will this algorithm start to work? So this was not stated in the theorem, but sort of it is efficient in some sense uh, for this algorithm to work. We need n to be bigger than these values. It looks ugly. It just says that okay. Sorry, I'm missing a ball here. Maybe this one is easier to read. This is nature. This is roughly saying that you should expect a point with a distance in R, so within every ball of radius Rm, you should have a point, uh, you should have a latent points in the graph. This part says, okay. On the other hand, n, I need to be bigger than this value. Rather than Rm, I need to Rm over some polynomial in D. But what's worse is that this needs to rise to the power d. So in terms of the, in the perspective of, how should I say this? In the volumetric perspective, this d, power d seems unnatural. But this is what we got from the estimate. We don't know how to improve it. And maybe the last remark is, is this an efficient algorithm or not? Because this is what I heard from many computer science talk. They say, okay, for every problem, you can find a polynomial in n algorithm to solve it as long as you choose the right parameter at first. And this is the case that we're in practice. It is 
expensive because if you want to recover a d-dimensional surface, you need to have exponential uh, in d many points for this algorithm. But on the other hand, uh, it's not because uh, the inefficiency of the algorithm itself, but this is due to you really want to recover the shape of some surface. This is the complexity of what it is. You want to recover the shape for every epsilon. Uh, you really want to have uh, for every epsilon ball, you need to have a point of in this surface. So. It is uh, the inefficiency comes from actually the complexity of the nature of the problem. So efficient and inefficient at the same time. That's how I flipped. And also about the remark on the assumptions on this uh, probability distance, distance probability functions. Uh, a few slides before I say. We don't want to have this assumption on M. Uh, it's better that my distance probability function has no dependency with M mute. That seems much more natural. But we can find some example to show that this is indeed uh, not possible. Suppose I have two manifolds, M1, M2. They're both just one dimensional manifold sitting in R2. And one is obtained by flipping this piece to the other side. If my p is a function, say, let me pick a small value r here, is some function which I don't care whatever it happens before, but once it after r, it becomes a constant. Then Indeed, if you equip these two manifold with a uniform measure on it and generate this random geometric graph, their distribution of the graph is the same because they are not able to distinguish the distance of these two points, given the fact that if your probability distance function can tell differentiate as much as this radius and everything else, this point and this point away, the connecting the probability is precisely the same. So in this way, they cannot distinguish, in particular, the underlying, uh, well, as I said, uh, the two resulting random geometric graph are precisely the same. So you are not able to recover the Euclidean distance. So you should have some way to distinguish the corresponding probability or the way to at least proportional to the diameter. And on the other hand, if I only want to recover the geodetic distance, it seems this assumption can be dropped. So you clean this distance, you need a geodetic distance. Since this is really from local, then you can drop this assumption. Simply assume that, OK, P decays nicely for certain region. And then we just you relies on those facts and recover the geodetic distance. Okay. And then there are also some related work uh, in manifold learning. Um, I think there's a lot of work there, but the most related one is the Fefferman, Ivanov, Turilev, Lassas, Lu, and Narayanan. In those cases, what they get sort of our ending point is precisely the starting point of this type of work. And there is you have uh, you, you have a collection of data and you have some manifold assumption assuming these data uh, data points are coming from a manifold so it's like a dense cloud of points up on the manifold and the goal there is to reconstruct a manifold fitting these data points and what they observe is the either the location of the data points or maybe just the distance between the data points. This is what we exactly this is what exactly we obtained after running our algorithm. And so indeed we can plug in our result to the result of theirs and obtain the following corollary saying that okay, now you have the random graph, you plug in into these two algorithms, you speed up a manifold such that 
you have a good approximation of the geodesic distance. So the output there is a manifold, Riemannian manifold, together with a diffeomorphism. And the errors of this ratio is L1 plus CM mu P n to a negative state. So you have a good approximation on the distance. Okay, so anything other than that? Oh, yes. We can present the result also so in a slightly classical sense. Uh, in the perspective that we try to construct a matrix space together with mu that approximate the manifold together with uh, the measure. So here we generate a graph gamma tilt. Uh, so again, the algorithm is taking the original graph uh, as input is bit out a triple. Gamma tilt is a subgraph, not, not a subgraph, a graph with a subvertex set of the original graph, and this is weighted again. The probability measure new on the vertex set of this subgraph, again, a DEUC, just like before. But in this perspective, is that now we can couple these two measures, new, mu and new, so that if I sample two independent copies, x u and x point u point, then with high probability, their geodesic distance approximate uh, the graph distance, the path distance, and at the same time, the Euclidean distance also approximate by this one. And there's also a statement about uh, you have a good comparison of volume of any ball on this uh, graph corresponding to the volume of the ball inside the uh, manifold M. Same for geodesic and Euclidean distance. This is not much comparing the, uh, this is not much difference comparing the same one, just you can modify it and phrase it in sort of a gromov hausdorff distance way. Okay, uh, any question or uh, should I continue? Um, I don't know if this question makes sense, but what would be the advantage of uh, generating such a, a second graph? Uh, uh, the, it's, the reason for generating a second graph so okay, it's not an M. It it is is the resulting. Yes, you are right. It's how should I phrase this? The goal is I want to find some uh an, a notion of DGD right on on this on V, so that my DGD of U U prime actually approximate DGD of X X prime in the manifold. And it just happens that the way we prove it is by constructing a graph and make it so that the path distance happens to be a good, a good uh, candidate for this uh, D2 GD. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's not the benefit, but just like how we prove it and we construct it in this way. I see, thank you. Yeah. Okay, then, then I will just illustrate the proof ideas. Okay. So I guess the first step is the difficult part. So first of all, if I want to figure out the distance of any two vertex, the underlying distance, then whether there's an edge or not tells you very minimal about this. You cannot say much about it. They connected an edge, maybe this doesn't tell you they are really close, neither the other case. So the naive thinking is the following. Suppose I have a point U and then I have a cluster of points, meaning that these are corresponding to vertices, but their underlying matrix are very close to U. So of course, if this is U prime, X U and X U prime has a distance of eta. This is what I mean by a cluster. Suppose I already know there's a cluster of point near uh, U and their distance, pairwise distance and most eta, now, picking any other point V, 
then to recover the distance from u and v, uh, one way to do it is just simply counting the numbers of edges from u to v. Because each of them is connected with probability, roughly the distance between xv and xu, with some error due to the radius of this eta here. And then now you sum this up, normalize it, then you get to these values. Here you have the concentration relying on the size of the cluster, and you add an error roughly, say, one over square root of the size of u. So this is simply just the sum of Bernoulli random variables. You have this concentration. So from here, we can actually recover the distance in this way. If I have a cluster here, and I have another vertex here, just counting the edges, I can recover the distance where, with error up to eta and also up to the size of the cluster. So as a big picture, what we want is to find a delta net, a delta net of not points, but a delta net of clusters. What I mean is that suppose we have the manifold like that, I want to find a collection of clusters such that each cluster, they have distance, say, eta, but then they have, uh, if I look at the ball of radius delta, so some other parameter, then the union of these balls contains n. So this is a, what I mean by a delta net of eta clusters. Once we get this, then I can navigate the distance, I can find a distance between any two points. For example, I have V1 here, I have V2 here. I'll find the closest cluster connecting, uh, closest cluster to V1. Then I know that this distance is delta. Same for V2. But between these two clusters, I can find the distance between them. Therefore, a simple triangle inequality, I can figure out the distance between V1, V2 up to an error that depending on the delta and also error depending on eta and the size of the uh, cluster size. So if I can done, do that, then everything is complete, more or less. And then the point is how can I find a cluster? Or in other words, how can I, for any given point, U, how can I find a cluster of points which are close to them? So the first guess what we want to think is that, okay, I want to look at the numbers of common neighbors. So N U, I'm denoting it as the neighbors of U intersecting N V for some other points. So my guess is that, okay, if n u and n v, the size of it is large, then distance of x u and x v is small. This is what we want. The bigger it is, maybe the smaller it is. the The smaller the distance it is, and if better, we have a quantitative control on this. One review the others. Uh, but this is uh, too ideal. It's not, uh, imagine the following scenario. I'm not drawing a manifold, but imagine I have a disk of points. This is my M. And somehow I modify this a little bit, okay? My M is actually not a manifold here, but just a, a good way to illustrate. I have a big disk here, and then my U and V somehow, I should say this is X U and X V, somehow are far away from this disk, but with an equal distance. Imagine that I have another point, also X U prime is here. Condition on the realization of we have these three points and do the same thing for the rest of the points. You could expect that 
the numbers of common neighbors of NU intersecting NV is roughly the same as the numbers of common neighbor between M prime, U prime, and NU. In sensor, it's very unlikely that you have some points to sample some other points here. Most of their common neighbor coming from this big disk. And the chance of uh, XU and XV having uh, this as a common neighbor is same as XU and XU prime. So in this case, one can be the two furthest point between this, uh, between in within M, but the other is like they're sitting together. So we are not able to review the distance in this way. Simply look at kinet common neighbors. But there is some way that you can handle this. It's not true if I want to focus on one point U, but somehow if we think this globally, there is actually some room to do this. So let's consider this function, okay, x, y, which is the expectation of z uh, according to nu. So it's sample this point uh, in nu, uh, in m. And then for any x, y in m, we consider the expectation of these pro products of probability. And if you think what it means is that suppose I have two point u and v such that xv is real x and xu is real y, then this expectation is precisely the probability that a third vertex is actually in the common neighbors of these two points, right? The chance that the probability that it's in the common neighbor is the product of these two probability, but then you also take expectation on where this this point is located. There. So this KXY is uh, is sort of the probability of the third point lies in their common neighbor, giving the realization of the two points. Then there is an interesting observation. If you simply apply Cauchy's Watts, then you realize that this is less than kxx times kyy. Nothing fancy. You just apply Cauchy's Watts, you get this uh, identity, so no, identity inequality. But the conclusion is that the function. KXY is maximized on the diagonal. Meaning if I look at all pair of XY, the, the maximum of this function is always reached as some KXX, where X and Y are the same. And this is good. What does it mean is that, okay, for typical points, it can be very sad that the numbers of common neighbor does not review anything. Uh, so it does not review what we want in terms of their distance. However, if you're looking at the extreme point, actually the common neighbors, the point that has the largest common neighbor should be the one that is closest to the point you are picking. So for some point, this feature is true. So what we did is some quantitative bound on how KXY deviate, uh, quantitative bounds on what we derived before in terms of this uh, Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. We can show that KXY less equal KXX plus KYY over two. Uh, in terms of how much is different, it's actually can be bounded by a term depending on the Euclidean distance. This tell us, give us some room to distinguish, say, okay, how far it is if comparing to either KXX or KYY. So mm -hmm. this is just a sort of a bound coming from estimating this term, the lower bound on the difference of this. If you expand it, uh, rearrange it, you can say, actually, I'm just trying to bounding this uh, term here. 
And so what we want is to rearrange this inequality and play in the role we want. Indeed, I don't just use uh, kx, x, kx, u, x, u, and kx, v, x, v. So here I'm plugging the vertices here. But I can look at it at the maximum over all vertices of these guys. And I have this inequality. Again, from concentration, I know that this is roughly the numbers of common neighbor over n. And that is that. And I have these terms here. So ideally, we want something like this to be true. Let's think for a moment of what this means. First, I'm looking at all common neighbors. I find a guy with the largest numbers of common neighbors. Now looking at any other two points and looking at the size of their common neighbors, if xu and xv are very close, then if u and v are very close to the maximizer, then their distance must be small. On the other hand, this is an inequality to tell us to throw away those points uv where either uv are farther away from the maximizer or in fact their uh, distance are further away from each other. So now, essentially what I'm trying, what we'll try to do is looking at find a maximizer of the common neighbors and select those points where pairwise have common neighbors, the size of it very close to the maximizer. And from there, I will extract a cluster in this way. And of course, there are lots of gaps uh, in this approximation. And this is the main reason that we don't have, sorry, I'm sliding a slide. Uh, the main reason that we have a drawback on this part. Due to the errors we have there, we cannot get sort of, in some sense, the optimal choice of n for such a algorithm to work. But this is the bigger picture. In this way, I can construct a cluster in this way, relying on this inequality. The problem is that, for example, if you see this, Actually, we can never observe this. This is u prime with the same u prime here. We can only hope for putting u prime, u double prime, and that hope for that the maximum of obtains when u double prime is sufficiently close to u prime. So there are lots of errors coming from these terms, but uh, we don't have a very good control there. Okay. So now, at first, the story is, okay, I have a point, I want to find a cluster around them, but now from what we realized is that, okay, I don't, I am not able to do that, but I can find you some cluster, except I don't know where the point it is. And so now the strategy is the following. I will break the graph into small batches. And from each batches, I'm trying to break, I consider, I'm trying to run what we discussed before to get a cluster. But once we get a cluster, we actually get some information about the matrix, at least distance to these clusters. And then somehow we will have some control on where we find the next cluster. So the simple picture is illustrated in this way. Okay, so here I have a cluster sort of we obtained from before. From there, I can say I pick a distance r, and we can use that to find all those points, which is within this with distance uh, roughly r from these clusters, with some some room there. So the picture is like so. The idea is like this. From the previous batch of vertices, we find a cluster here. Now we throw in a new cluster a new batch of points, the underlying points are in the manifold, but then we want to throw away those points with distance which is not roughly r. We can do this by looking at the common neighbor as we discussed before. Now, if I try to run 
the algorithm and I want to find another class here. What we hope is that ideally, if we restrict to this set of clusters, this set of points, the orange color one, and we try to run the similar arguments and then we can extract another cluster, which is roughly distance R to the original cluster. And then we, we have some control on the next cluster we are generating, right? And if we can do this, maybe we can find when at the point we are finding next cluster, we can impose two distance constraints from the previous two clusters. And the more we get, we have more control on the next cluster we are generating. And it turns out this sort of idea works. Uh, this is some, uh, so you're basically saying that, okay, I have some cluster. I want to look at all other points from the new batch, which are within distance R with some small error of epsilon. Then I'm looking at the same inequality, like what we have done before. But let me be precise here. What we are looking at are uh, among all those V1, V2 in V prime. V prime are these purple dots. And we are looking at the common neighbors. Sorry, I should, this is written wrong. This is NV1, V1, and NV, V2. We're still looking at the common neighbor of the whole graph. So that would get a good approximation to K. And there we want to find a maximum but restricted to V prime, V one prime, V double prime, V prime. And we hope still the same type of inequality hold. And the goal is trying to do that. And the main, main work of the, the paper is trying to justify that this idea actually works and with the, with the tuning of the parameter and that whenever you generate new cluster, you don't have a expansion on the size of the cluster radius and things like that. I think maybe it's good I stop here. To... Yeah, the, the, the whole big picture is building on this, yeah. Thank you very much, Han. Uh, are there any questions Thank you. or comments? Um, a question here, the, the graph that you have, the geometric graph, uh, is given mm -hmm. to you as a black box. You cannot go in and like draw more points, but now to make sure you construct the net of clusters yourself, like draw like another N points, but now make sure you draw them uh, in, in I... clusters. The, sorry, I didn't. I didn't, I didn't you don't have it, access I, to the manifold, right? You only see the random geometry graph. You don't. Okay. Yes, I, when I draw, it looks like I know all the, everything, but no, I only yes, I only know the know the graph itself. And but, but for each time I extract a cluster, and now I can navigate a distance to every other cluster by looking at the common neighbor. Somehow it's like. Step by step, are reviewing more and more matrix of the manifold itself. I and see. Sort of in the end, I review, I, I build up a, a delta net of clusters. So at that point, I know most of the part of the manifold. And also in the error, um, a term that you have the n to the minus c over d, the c depends on these parameters of the manifold, or it's an absolute constant? It's a, it's a fixed constant. Okay. It's a fixed constant, but on the other hand, we cannot make it so you say it's the one over D. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there any other? Would, uh... Oh, sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> any other questions or comments? What if you get um, multiple samples of the graph instead of just one? Um, Multiple sample of the graph, uh, but then uh, say if I get k samples, uh, okay, it's slightly different from g k n and mu p, right? Yeah, yeah, it, that's different. Yeah. Uh, 
in terms of how much better I can do it, right? Uh, yeah, it's not no no hundred percent clear in my mind because these two two they are separate graph. I cannot connect them in this way. Yeah, so I don't have a good answer for that. Any other questions? Does your algorithm help with the um, distinguishability problems that you had at the beginning with the table to uh, distinguish this from an erdos rainy graph? Would that help? Then I would say it's a much inefficient way to do that. Oh. I think the origin, the, 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 those pay, but okay. I don't know. You are, if you're assuming you are on a manifold, I, I think there are other features which should be much easier to detect because mm -hmm. this is expensive. You want to learn the whole shape. You are really saying, I'm comparing this to the ball. Maybe there are some other feature much easier to detect than really related to construct. So yeah, in my opinion, uh, distinguishing should be should be something can be done much easier. Of course, depending on your how different are the two space, right? If mm -hmm. one is a manifold, the other is one, the same thing with the small bump, you expect it is as difficult as reconstructing the manifold itself. But but other than that, maybe I think there there should be much easier and efficient algorithm to do this distinguish. Yeah. Okay, if there are no other questions or comments, uh, we thank Han a lot for the talk, the very interesting talk, and uh, uh, we'll see you again uh, next week. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you.